All right, so I just wanted to thank uh, Paul and, and Jason for inviting me to speak to you guys tonight. <clears throat> just uh, throw something at me if I'm going too fast or I'm not speaking loud enough, let me know and I'll slow down or speak louder. Um, so just give you a little bit about me. I am, uh, in addition to being a PhD student, I have been active in uh, the labor movement both in the U.S. and Canada for probably 15 years. I've worked as a union staff representative for the American Federation of Teachers in New York, as well as the United Electrical Workers in Connecticut. Uh, and I'm currently on my negotiating uh, team for QP3903 at York University. I uh, spent about two years doing field work in Chicago and New York City. Um, in Chicago, the year before the great 2012 strike that has been made famous and infamous in some circles. and. Uh, really kind of looking at how how corporate education reform or what most teachers activists that I know call deform has materialized on the ground in different places in, in American cities and how how teachers with parents with community allies and students have really been organizing to build a movement to fight and and build something different to kind of push back against privatization standardized testing and the attack on teacher unions and really understand kind of what's what's the logic behind that both in the US but also kind of more broadly as it's connected to a wider global project of political and economic restructuring that's been happening since the mid to late 1970s most people refer to it as neoliberalism and I think I want to <laughs> I would make a push for us to hold on to this kind of concept of neoliberalism as we think about what's happening here in Ontario under Hudak or under the Liberals or under the Conservatives, you know, especially in Ontario, stretching back to 1995 with that uh, Harris regime here. Um, because what what I'm going to talk to you in more depth today about is, you know, how corporate education reform is happening in in the states, and it's a very extreme case of uh, vicious attack on teachers, demonization of teachers, educators, and the, the unions that represent them as well as the kids that are most and communities most underserved by public schools, uh, which are largely poor African-American and Latino kids in the inner cities of America's uh, great cities, Chicago and New York, which are my case studies. So what, that's the first point I want to make. Like, so all the kind of advancements of neoliberalism, the corporate uh, agenda in education has really come pretty, uh, pretty far in the U.S. And especially since 2001, with the passing of No Child Left Behind under, under the former uh, President uh, George W. Bush, and it's only accelerated under President Barack Obama with uh, Race to the Top, which is an expansion of No Child Left Behind, kind of uh, a reform, uh, neoliberal reform of NCLB on steroids. Um, and what's driving this really <coughs> Um, is a couple things. I mean, <clears throat> the first thing is to know, right? Like, uh, educator and uh, teacher uh, activist Lois Weiner, with former president of the National Union of Teachers in Britain, Mary Compton, have really been pushing for at least the past six years that what's going on in the U.S. is not it's not unique, right? And it's part of a, again this global project uh, at the center, of which is the destruction of unions, the undermining of working class power, and the expansion of the logic of <coughs> corporation, of businesses into areas of life that have been previously protected, like public schools, like healthcare. Um, and the biggest opponents of this, you know, regardless of how we might feel as uh, members of our unions, the biggest opponents and most potentially powerful forces to organize against this stuff are teacher unions. Um, and it often doesn't feel that way, right? Like, I mean, I think a lot of us can feel very demoralized, like our unions aren't doing enough, aren't um, fighting enough, aren't engaging the membership enough, and that is largely true in a lot of places, in the U.S. as well as Canada. Um, but the fact remains that there are 29 million teachers across the world organized into unions or professional associations of some kind. Right? In New York alone, the, the, the local for New York City is over 200,000 members of not just teachers but nurses, 
um, child care workers, clinicians, speech pathologists, uh, social workers, and so on. Chicago is, is not quite that big. It's uh, about 26,000 active members. Um, but the, these unions are, you know, like in the U.S. and Canada, the labor movement is largely a public sector movement. But, you know, at the forefront of that movement are the teacher unions. So p the biggest potential roadblock to further imposing systems of merit pay, you know, charter schools, which are um, sometimes for-profit, sometimes not-for-profit schools that are not governed by uh, the, the democratically accountable school boards, um, voucher programs, which are haven't really taken off that much except for places like Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is the largest kind of voucher and most successful from a corporate standpoint, um, you know, basically where you're giving um, you get just giving a voucher to parents to send their kids to any private school, right? So taking that money out of the public system, further defunding schools, and this especially hurts the schools that have been, you know, largely over the past 20, 30 years, um, you know, further annihilated by budget cuts and sucking the money out of communities, right? Uh, you know, in, in the South Bronx, in the South and, and West <coughs> of Chicago. Um, you know, in, in the poor neighborhoods of uh, St. Paul, Minneapolis. Um, so the, those are like some of the kind of, I would stress, <coughs> well, thinking about how the project is working across the board. You know, corporate public education reform is playing out very differently in different cities and different countries. But the most important thing I want to stress to you guys is that, you know, and, and we can feel it here, right, the attack on unions. The attempt to dismantle, undermine the power of unions, whether that's taking away their ability to strike, um, imposing contracts. Right? I'm not. I'm not saying anything you guys haven't felt in the past couple of years. Um, you know, threatening to take away automatic dues checkoff in, in Canada, known as the Rand formula. Right? Um, all these things are about weakening the power of unions. In order to expand charter schools, right? So defund the traditional neighborhood schools, either close them down entirely, which has been a massive, a massive um, problem in New York, Milwaukee, Los Angeles, and, and, and Philadelphia, which is a bit of a special case because they've completely flipped the entire school system upside down, worse than, I mean, the, the two kind of worst examples of, of neoliberal savaging of public education is New Orleans and Philadelphia. And they're both so extreme, I won't get into the details, but completely flipped over what had been a, a problematic but still public system. Um, so that's key, right? And, and part of what's driving this logic, again, is um, you know a desire to undercut the power of what exists today still of working class organizations and unions, which is the public sector and the teachers. Um, but also this kind of recognition that public education needs to be reoriented according to the model of a, of a business, of a corporation. And that includes getting rid of democratically elected school boards, which you know, we haven't seen anywhere in Canada as of yet, and appointing you know, um, mayoral control um, school boards instead where mayors select. So just imagine Rob Ford picking you know, the majority of the reps on the TDSB and no, no elections have to happen. I mean, in Chicago, they, they've just gone beyond like just your average rich person to appointing billionaires like Penny Pritzker, right? The heiress of that, the Hilton, or high uh, hotels rather. Um, so it's very, it, it's, it's so transparent now that kind of what, whose interests the people that are appointed to these boards the billionaire philanthropists that are supporting these policies, whether it's Bill and Melinda Gates, or Eli Broad, or the Waltons who run Walmart, right? Driven both by the ideological commitments to destroying public universal institutions like education, like schools, um, but also there's a lot of money to be made in education. In the U.S., there's you know five. You're talking about annually a 500 billion dollar budget that private uh, capital wants to sink their teeth into. Companies like Pearson, I mean, it's a whole, this is another kind of element of why standardized testing and, and all the materials that need to be rewritten every year 
uh, and the different initiatives that get shoved down the throats of teachers and educators <coughs> apparently don't know what they're doing and they need to have experts who've never been inside a classroom <laughs> tell them how to teach. Um, part of that's about selling all these materials and making you know, some companies in these sectors incredible, incredibly uh, wealthy. That's a real thing. I don't think that's <coughs> the main driver of, of these reforms. It's a huge part of this ideological commitment on the part of the neoliberal um, political and economic organizations, like some of the foundations I men mentioned, all of their political parties that serve them in the US, that's the Democrats and the Republicans alike. Um, and just a worthy of note, like in Chicago, has been a Democrat town for many, many decades. And the Democratic mayor that the Chicago Teachers Union had to go up against and has been going up against since Karen Lewis and the Caucus of Rank and File Educators came into power in 2010 is Rahm Emanuel, is Obama's right hand man, before he stepped down and decided to run for mayor. Um, and which is an interesting move, just as an aside, like why, why the right hand man of the, the president would leave to become a mayor of a city. Uh, this, you know, part of that is because he wants to set up his own career, and what he wanted to do was, like Harris in 1995, make education reform the pillar of his of his movement to reorient to common sense kind of thing, and have on his resume the destruction of uh, the mighty teachers union and pushing forward the corporate agenda. Right. This is also, you know, so the the kind of right wing and the neoliberal movement for corporate education reform in the U.S. Um, and and. I would argue here as well uses um, you know some real and some some manufactured problems that exist within the public school system to justify its moves, right? So they've in the in the U.S. <coughs> taken up you know education reform as the new civil rights movement. So you get a lot of Wall Street types, people working in hedge funds, saying, "Yeah, the, you know." Reforming education is the number one priority. It's a new civil rights movement that I can get behind. Um, so co-opting the language of civil rights and fighting for equity and fighting for justice. And the only people and their organizations in the way of that are teachers who and the unions who basically are just an adult interest group that don't care about kids, don't care about um, schools, don't care about the poorest and most marginalized historically uh, communities, right? So that's kind of, that's the main thrust of it. Um, so charter schools, expanding um, private industry, whether that's, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of tech firms are contracting into, into uh, education, um, the textbook manufacturers, um, reorganization of how education school systems, districts are governed, right, taking away you know, the, the problematic, but at least more democratic uh, elected, electable school boards, a huge piece. Um, but the one thing I wanted to highlight here is the attack on teacher professionalism. Because I think that's one of the things that, that teachers in Canada and Ontario in particular have really faced, including in this last round of negotiations uh, where agreements were more or less imposed on you. <coughs> to a large extent, um, the attack on the grid system, right? Paying teachers for their experience and for their education and credentials, right? That's a major thing that's coming north of the border. And it, it's, it's an insidious way and it's, it's sometimes hard to really kind of make into a popular issue, but I think uh, if we look towards what the Chicago Teachers Union and now the United Teachers of Los Angeles and in particular uh, the Teachers Union in St. Paul, um, have done to really kind of organize and mobilize public support around a defense of teacher professionalism. It's key. Uh, so part of why teachers' professionalism is under attack, right, is because they want to flexibilize the workforce. They want to they want to bring in teachers that aren't actually trained as teachers. For instance, Teach for America is might be a program you all familiar. How, how many of you guys have heard for Teach for America? How many of you heard of Teach for Canada? So that's so we could talk about that. That this is a cutting edge kind of, and you know, where it's going and where it is now, it we'll see. Uh, but this is definitely clear and present danger of these policies tra traveling across <coughs> north of Canada. And what it is, is that it's de it's destroying professionalism, so that you have a, a basically a workforce that doesn't 
have a master's degree, doesn't really get trained in teacher's college, can just go in and come out quickly, stays for maybe two or three years. You know, Karen Lewis jokes, it's, it's not, not called Teach for America, but Teach for a while. So you come in, <laughs> two or three years, you're out, you get down your resume, and then you get a nice job somewhere else. Um, and that's basically what the corporate reformers want. It's what politicians, elected officials across the board in the U.S. want. And that's largely because they need a new education system that aligns with the totally polarized uh, labor market and the, the economy more generally in the U.S. and I would argue Canada um, that's developing where you have an erosion of middle income jobs and you have, you know, it's kind of like a U, right? So you have a huge growth at the low end of the labor market, you know, the MIG jobs, and then you have some, some serious growth at the high end, but for a few people, and then the middle is kind of hollowing out. So we need an education system so the line goes. Um, it's not explicitly stated this way except in some World Bank documents and some OECD documents. Um, but if you can read between the lines and if you look at the kind of restructuring of labor markets in the US and in Canada and kind of what jobs are being created or not, um, it's, it's largely a the majority of kids are getting trained and getting ready for mid jobs, low, low wage service sector employment. And if that's the case, then why do you need teachers with uh, master's degrees or, or doctorates or that have been well trained and that are professionals? You don't. They're very costly, and that's a fact, right? Like, that, that is a big part of education budgets, and it should be because the teachers are at the center of, of good quality education. <coughs> But if we, you know, if you're no longer trying to really develop a workforce, a high-skilled workforce, because those jobs don't exist, right? You see, kind of see where I'm going with it, right? So you have to attack the kind of teacher professionalism, restructure, reorganize the work, and that includes like scripted curriculum. Teachers have no say in lesson planning. It's a kind of lean pr pr production process. And if you guys want a, an amazing book that looks at how this has worked in Ontario. Alan Sears, Retooling the Mind Factory, really uses the kind of Harris regime to explore a lot of how it kind of education is being restructured, uh, part of, partly to reorganize uh, education for a mixed world uh, and the mixed citizenship, right? So not preparing kids to be actually critical thinkers engaged in politics and so on. So maybe I'll leave it there on the kind of what the corporate agenda is about in U.S. education and maybe turn to some strategies for resistance because <laughs> I think that's the more exciting bit. And I think it's, uh, I think you guys kind of generally get a sense of what the contours are. I, I will just, before I kind of shift gears to talk a little bit about the resistance, I want to again emphasize like it, it really, if we've learned anything from the U.S., if we learn this, that it doesn't matter the political party or the whatever we think as um, this is a conservative issue or it's a democratic issue, like, and I would say the same here. It doesn't really matter. And of course, it matters if, if Hudak becomes, uh, gets into power, but both the liberals and the conservatives and the NDP to some extent, who, you know, early 90s Ontario was largely in power when tuition was getting hyped up in the post-secondary sector. We shouldn't forget that. This is a part of a broader political and economic agenda that we can't just assume it's carried forth by one particularly nasty politician. Uh, and I, I would really want to emphasize that. So I'll stop there and move just very quickly to talk about um, just a couple things that teacher unions and their allies have been doing in the US. So one is going on strike, but organizing strikes in a very different kind of a way. Um, so, you know, making it not just a strike of workers, but a, sh a strike of a whole city, right? Really organizing, getting parents, getting neighbors, getting lunch ladies, getting folks um, from all walks of life in that city electrified. And getting, you know, in a real way, the only way to do that is not just kind of, you know, say our working conditions, our students' learning conditions, but actually make that meaningful. You know, create a document like the CTU did called uh, the schools Chicago students deserve. Um, you know, feeding Chicago's kids the food they deserve, which was produced by the Union of Cafeteria Workers in Chicago. 
this I, I kind of highlight these, these two documents as examples because um, they've been taken up most uh, effectively in Los Angeles in St. Paul uh, by teacher unions there and I'll just say like there were I think we're going to circulate some copies of some of this material so you guys can check it out. I'll, I'll pass some around now if you want to take a quick look if you haven't seen it. Um, in Chicago, they really they produced this research, um, one to kind of reorient the public discourse around what is the crisis in public education, who is really responsible, what, what have been the impacts of these so-called reforms over the past 12 years in one place, and how does it connect with this larger political economic restructuring and attack on teachers and public education generally? And how, you know, how is it impacting, you know, in Chicago, especially really thinking about the racial impact of these policies and the targeting of African American teachers and students alike um, who are getting the kind of hammer over many other communities and, and groups of people within the union. Um, but building, using this kind of piece of the research, cutting it down so you can bring it to meetings, you can hold public forums, you can bring people in neighborhoods throughout a city or a particular area into conversation about what do we actually want to fight for together. Right, so not just going to communities or going to parents and imposing what you think they should want, <laughs> but actually listening and shaping your policy, shaping your research based, and shaping your, your demands at the bargaining table based on what you're hearing from parents and community members and students. Um, and as, as beautiful as the document the CTU produced and that process was in Chicago, the teachers union in St. Paul uh, really took it to a completely different level. Um, where before they even produced a report, like uh, the school's St. Paul students deserve, they had lots of these forums. They, they had parents and students, community members, putting forward basically proposals to their executive, to their bargaining committee, to their union, coming completely you know, out of conversations and what they call listening sessions. So building, really building those kind of alliances in the community between um, public school workers and parents and neighbors at, at grassroots level in the most genuine sense. Um, and that, drive, that kind of those relationships, that research generated and the proposals generated through that iterative process of community organizing, I think is a real key that we need to that we pick up on. Um, you know, the, one of the best things that Chicago did while they were doing that is they didn't neglect the workplace. Because this could also be a shortfalling of a lot of community union strategies, where people, unions in particular, kind of give up on trying to organize their members at the workplace and see the workplace as not really being a site of real power anymore. But that couldn't be further from the truth when your workplace is a school, which in many uh, neighbors is a kind of a heart of the community or it should be made the heart of the community, which is another kind of way to think about how we can create a real fight back movement that goes beyond contesting corporate agenda in education and really pushing for a different vision of education. And again, so <clears throat> that different vision of education, that different vision of what's possible for schools is really emerging in a lot of these uh, resistance campaigns, whether it be in LA, Chicago, and Philly, it's not just about like defending the status quo, which is kind of, you know, both in Canada and in the U.S., something that enemies of teacher unions and, and public education like to put out there, that teachers don't care, they just want to defend what they have, they have, you know, there's certain things we should defend and we should be proud and should be open about saying what, we've ha what we have, what we've won, you know, autonomy in the classroom, developing curriculum, working with students, you know, the advances we've made we should be more vocal about. Um, but we should also recognize, and I think, you know, both the Chicago Teachers Union in LA and some of the other cases I've cited, recognize that there was no kind of golden age of public education in America, and I would say they're not in Canada either. Like a lot of the education, the liberal model of education, and you, and you see the critique emerging in these reports, sometimes slowly, sometimes more explicitly, but a lot of that liberal education that, that we, we have to defend on the one hand, really always did a disservice to a lot of kids in the sense that a lot of it has been Eurocentric, has marginalized you know, particular bodies of knowledge, it hasn't been culturally relevant for a lot of folks, and 
quite frankly, has not really sought to empower students to be, you know, critical citizens, engaged political actors, but just passive recipients and has served to educate them for a labor market, although a better labor market, you know, 20 years ago, right? Um, so those are kind of a couple of the examples of resistance I wanted to highlight. Some of the other kind of really important things I think that we've seen in Seattle, in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, you know, um, in Chicago <coughs> to some extent, is collective uh, organizing against standardized tests, the boycotting of exams. You know, my friend Doug did this in the Bronx about eight years ago, and he got fired. He was he's not he hasn't he can work now, but he was banned from working in New York City for five years. The United Federation of Teachers didn't have his back, and there was no real movement to help support him, right? But now things are different. So, I mean, he was a young teacher, he was a fired up activist, and he probably got a little too ambitious, but his students wanted to fight and he helped them, and so he doesn't regret what he did. But now is a different moment where there are, there are networks and there are infrastructures of, of, of resistance building up in these different cities, and people forming collectives to actually you know, engage in a student-teacher boycott of exams, at the heart of which, again, is restructuring work and restructuring education for, you know, the kids who actually need a help, a lot more help than is being given. Um, you know, and the, again, I'll just maybe end on this, why I think that's so important to target, um, and think about, like, what is, how do you organize a boycott campaign? Not that we necessarily are there yet, because those, kind of the role that standardized testing plays in the U.S. hasn't advanced to the same degree within Canada. But just the nature of, um, of organizing and movement building that is emerging around uh, creating movements against the standardized test as well as it for the, the strike in Chicago in 2012 is, is a similar kind of model of unionism that I think really is something we need to emulate in, in Toronto, Ontario, and, and throughout Canada. And that's a, that's a grassroots social justice unionism that comes up from the bottom. And one in which all members are engaged as active participants and see the union as something that they create on a daily basis and that we're all proud of doing. So maybe I'll just end there and have a, a discussion for us. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, I just want to point out too, before I take questions too and comments, that this, uh, this handout here is a compilation of different documents uh, that Peter forwarded to us. And if you want to flip through this while you, you think of um, conversation, includes um, a basically a statement put out by the Chicago Teachers Union uh, debunking merit pay uh, or pay for performance. There's also a, a document here, a vision for the schools that LA students deserve from the United Teachers of Los Angeles. And there's also a big document here, uh, also by the Chicago Teachers Union, around uh, standardized testing as deployed in the US and for smaller class sizes too. So please take a look at that. <coughs> and I'm, so I'm gonna open up now and I see I have, I have Oren, and, uh, and then I have Tim, and then I have Rip. So I'll start with Oren. Maybe I just work in a bit of an outlier school, but it, it seems to me that before you get into your communities and, and uh, start organizing your community when, when things get tough, um, we need to probably start with organizing our own teachers. I mean, I just came from a staff meeting where the principal uh, thanked all the teachers who supported him in uh, trying to impose a breathalyzer on students to, to go to prom. Mm -hmm. And uh, other teachers who, who saw that as a, you know, a, some, some fundamental constitutional issues, uh, uh, you know they were they were just ignored. So uh, I I think I think uh, I think we're we're probably uh, before we start organizing communities we have to organize ourselves. Yeah. I mean I've I've got I've got colleagues who tell me that uh, that the curriculum is not standardized enough. Every every student in Ontario should be you know doing the same activity on day four as every other student and. and uh, you know, the, the list could sort of go on. Yeah. Want to comment on that? Or? Yeah, just a real quick one. I, I think that's kind of, this is why I emphasize the point about what's been going on in Chicago and, I, and not abandoning the school building or the workplace, right? And, and actually, I think you can do both sometimes. Sometimes it, it depends. It really, 
we need to figure out where we're at in our school and our neighborhood and see kind of what the issues are. And I really think, yeah, for sure, organizing in the school building is the first step. And I think that's actually why it's so important once you have that at least an organized crew. And even if it's just around like holding meetings about talking about like, well, what does the standard curriculum look like? How has Common Core in the U.S. actually been working for them? And it's been kind of a nightmare. I mean, just have you know, have some more informal co coffee or drink discussions around some of those issues, even for people who might be, you know, not necessarily wanting to become activists in that building in your school, but want just want to have those conversations. It's a place to start, and those are skills, right? How do you how do you kind of organize those meetings? How do you start to really have organizing conversations and not just kind of gripe about particular things, which I find educators in particular are really good at <laughs> wanting to gripe but not necessarily wanting to move beyond the gripe. Um, but yeah, for sure, I would I totally agree. I mean, I'm not advocating that we just like forget trying to get our coworkers pissed off and, and collectively organized on workplace issues and just go to the community. It really depends, I think, and I think we have to do both. How about I take three people and then I go back to Peter? Is that, is that okay? Yeah. Okay, so I have, uh, I have Tim, Rick, and then and Sean. Okay, so Tim. Uh, I think when we look at uh, the other major jurisdictions, uh, English-speaking jurisdictions, such as the UK and the States, um, and we see what's happening in those countries, and we look at what's happening here, the tendency is to think, oh, God, we've got it easy. And in a sense, we have. I mean, there's only one uh, high-stakes test, 2010 literacy test, as opposed to a panoply of tests in the States and England. We don't have merit pay even seeming to loom on the horizon, and we still have seniority, where all those things are being mercilessly uh, attacked in the States. <coughs> Having said that, I think there are warning signs for us in Canada. There was a report just came out in Alberta um, from uh, some high standing commission from the Alberta government where they are recommending uh, merit pay for teachers. So it won't be long, I, th I don't think, before these things percolate down to Ontario. But what I, the thing I got from your uh, comments, and I, I, I think is the important stuff, is how what is happening in the teacher unions and uh, how they're resisting. And a book I would strongly recommend to people from Labor Notes, How to Jump Start Your Union. It's the story of the Chicago Teachers Union, the development of the rank and file caucus core, and how they did things and how the strike happened and what's happened since the strike. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just Chicago. You mentioned Los Angeles. There's been reform slates that have been running against the incumbents in a number of um, cities, Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, Seattle, some of them being successful, some not, but they are organizing and uh, generally on the lines as you suggest, social justice unions. And if you talk about an issue that we could maybe get involved in, you talked about the boycott issue of standardized tests. Well, I think uh, one of the things where the union has linked up with the community in the States the big push isn't so much the teachers, or you've got teacher boycotts in Seattle and other places, but you've got now a parent movement, the opt-out movement. So the parents are getting involved and getting, you know, sending the message to parents that you don't need to um, um, have your kids go through these standardized tests. You can withdraw them. And I think um, if our union were to take a stand on that, I'm not arguing that we should immediately instruct teachers to boycott the, uh, the standardized tests. But I think <coughs> looking up to the, linking up with the communities and saying, well, these are your options. Legally, it's possible to opt out. Present the information to them and try and develop some kind of information like that. I'll leave it down. Okay, thank you. Uh, over to Rick. Um, I'm just wondering in your experience, uh, the, uh, I know there's not much distinction between the political parties, Republican and, and um, Democrat in the United States, especially at the top end. Uh, even less so probably in Canada. 
uh, despite the fact that we might think that there is. Uh, but for me, it seems strange. Before the last election, uh, we were already. It seems like the austerity seems to be the like the the wedge that gets these ideas in. Like we can't afford things, so we need some reform that's going to push things along. But it didn't happen during the election uh, last time. It happened after the election. Uh, so like there was there was a clear budget deficits going into the election. But no liberal candidate ran on a reform agenda and talking about taking a hard line on teachers. But after the fact, seemingly like uh, they pulled a 180. And I'm just interested in your experience. What seems to be the entry point? Like how do who brings these ideas forward? Is it is it the party itself, the interest, the corporate interests that you're talking about, or is it like academic interests that are like? Is it like who's lying and waiting, and waiting for their opportunity to strike? And is it possible to know that in advance, or is it just the, the mobilization that you're talking about? Is it always going to be a reactionary to uh, <coughs> to these things, or can can we see it coming in advance? And do we know who the people who are, who are bringing it are? Okay, if one more person, then I'll go back to Peter. Sean. Um, <clears throat> so, just maybe three quick questions this is related. It has to do with the union bureaucracy. So, was there any ousting of the union bureaucracy that happened? Um, and, all, and also, how did the rank and file members convince the union bureaucrats to support their rights? We know that, generally speaking, except for maybe longshoremen, uh, <laughs> union bureaucrats always tampen uh, or tamper or dampen uh, the uh, movement from below. It's their almost their raison d'etre happens. Right? That's a cardinal rule. Um, and then the last one is beyond the documents of the actual that you passed around. Um, I mean, I looked at the CTU one, and that was like, looked like our professionally speaking, my god, it was so glossy and, and just, you know, it, so beyond those sort of fabricated photo ops and stuff like that, what did the unions do to appeal to the, like, uh, mass of general public to get them uh, more or less, you know, on their sides? And just asking because, uh, again, the CTU one seemed like, I mean, who, who has time to read through that? You know, certainly not, you know, the person who's just so strapped, stressed for uh, time and money and everything. That's a great question. Maybe I'll just start with that. Some of your questions, I think. Um, yeah, so in, in Chicago, in Los Angeles, in Newark, um, in, in St. Paul as well, um, there's been a number of what I would describe as rank and file teacher rebellions and, and organizing um, uh, of people that have been sick and tired of uh, their unions basically either not fighting for them or selling them out. And, and that goes all the way up to the top of the AFT at Randy Weingarten who comes out of New York City, which is traditionally the local that selects and controls the national union. Um, and, and, you know, her, her approach and the AFT's approach from on high has been, um, how do we better collaborate with mayors and with school districts <coughs> to, to, to be on partners with reform? And they mean corporate reform. They mean how do we, how do we maybe run our own charter schools as a union? You know, how do we, how do we negotiate these kind of merit pay systems that work better for our members if they ever can? Um, and they think they can, like they have done in New Haven, Connecticut, and uh, St. Louis uh, teacher evaluation systems that are tied to merit pay as well as um, what they call value added metrics for standardized testing. So, how much a student improves each year. Um, very kind of neoclassical economic modeling uh, for evaluating students. Um, so the bureaucracy within the kind of larger teacher unions, the parent unions of these locals, for sure is not a fan of this kind of grassroots social justice unionism, which is not afraid to go to communities, not afraid to organize their workplace, and have active chapters at every school, which is um, only a result of these rank and file rebellions and these organizations in Chicago you know, there was a kind of constellation of factors in terms of an economic crisis in 2008, a delegitimation of their leadership that allowed a relatively um, young group 
that was founded in 2008 really take over the union in 2010, only two years after being formed with maybe a couple hundred members. And out of that couple hundred, really probably 50 diehard activists, <laughs> you know, including including Karen Lewis, Jesse Sharkey, um, you know, Noreen Gutekunst is the organizing director, a number of really solid people that have been teaching for over 20 years or so in Chicago. You know, and the same the same is true in, in Los Angeles. Uh, the professional uh, Progressive Education Action Caucus has been, which you know, did take over their union prior to four coming to power, and, and since has come in again with a kind of left progressive coalition. Um, because the the kind of bureaucracies and and just not just bureaucracy, it's not just a problem of bureaucracy, but it's also a problem of membership, right? So the left, the progressives in LA before before the CTU emerged as this new kind of model, um, <coughs> did take over the union. They, did, they weren't able to successfully, you know, stop a couple of thousand layoffs of their members, and then the members of the union kicked them out. And that's the general, so it's not just a problem of bureaucracy, but it's a problem of members not necessarily wanting to be, you know, part of a, a super active, militant, engaged, progressive, movement-oriented trade union. So that takes a lot of education and organizing and conversations and actions to get people to see the effectiveness that can happen. So it's a, it's a kind of problem of what our unions have become, the fact that members don't know how to organize and so on, um, and don't necessarily see themselves as the union. And we all, as active members, can sympathize with that, I think. Um, what was your last question I think you had? Oh, just besides the documents, what else did they do? Oh, yeah, so the, the documents I want to emphasize, like, so there was a lot of corporate funding for radio and TV events against the Chicago teachers when they went on a strike. And some members wanted to see the union fight fire with fire and take out ads themselves and so on. But that's a strategy they chose not to do. And I think this is an especially important lesson for the Canadian labor movement when our Canadian Labor Congress, our national federation, is dumping way too much of our money into slick ads and, and thinking that's going to be the communication strategy to flip the tide in Canada for working people. And the fact is, like those, the slick booklets I handed around, you know, <laughs> that was for the members of the union to really learn and, and know their issues well. And the union um, used one page kind of summaries, kind of nailing down bullet points of what they were fighting for, which they used in public forums and so on. But the, that, was, that was more of a capacity building strategy within its membership. So that members could then, when they were on strike, and prior to the strike, go out and talk to their parents, whose parents could then talk to their neighbors. And so that all the members, like, you know, like thousands of members in Chicago really knew what the hell it is they were fighting for, and could explain and cite research and break down the policies that were being advocated, you know, by Rahm Emanuel and by these corporate reformers and put forward a vision of their own, right? So they had everybody on the same page. and and passionately advocating for it, which then kind of had a real huge spillover effect. And that's something I think we need to learn from. The question of like who, what are the forces, what are the organizations in Canada kind of waiting in the wings or, or really advocating? I'm not the expert on it. I mean, I would say, you know, definitely within the <coughs> political parties themselves, especially the conservatives are developing a lot of, um, uh, a lot of this kind of analysis and policy, but also, um, what is it, the Canadian um, CEO, CE? <coughs> yeah, Canadian Council of Chiefs Executives? Yeah, Canadian Council of Chiefs Executives recently put out uh, a report advocating a merit pay scheme for teachers, right? And as well, and Alberta, again, is another kind of laboratory, always on the cutting edge, Alberta. You gotta love them, especially in education and other kind of neoliberal reforms. Um, the only province in Canada with charter schools, right? Like. Uh, so it's being tested in different places and, and emerging out of certain political parties and some of the, the Fraser Institute is another one. Um, there's a couple very uh, hard right <coughs> liberal think tanks that are developing this stuff, but maybe I'll let Paul or somebody who knows Canada better than me help okay. explain that one. Okay, well, all right, I, I have, uh, because I have uh, Manfred and Janice. Anyone else wants to join the speakers list? Okay, Theo? Okay, so I have uh, Manfred, go ahead. Well, just to, just to remark on your last point, sure. probably at the turn of the last century with a million American settlers moved into Western Canada. They brought their rugged individualism with 
explains the attitude in Alberta. Alberta. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> the attitude in Alberta, to some degree, parts of BC and Saskatchewan. Anyway, um, when you mentioned early on in your presentation that uh, you know that the union movement in Ontario, certainly much of Canada, is really a public sector union, I think that's the fundamental crux of it. When you look at the weakness of the private sector union movement in the U.S., Canada, U.K. to some degree, uh, there, there's a clear correlation, I think. Uh, and I think we're maybe not, although we have uh, coalitions that we work with, uh, we don't necessarily make the pitch to two-thirds of the public who don't have children or grandchildren in the public education system anymore in this province. We, we continue to advocate on an altruistic level that, well, of course everybody knows public education is one of the pillars of society. <coughs> Two-thirds of the public doesn't necessarily think that. When I think back to the two-week uh, political protest we had over 15 years ago that some people around this table may not remember, uh, we had an incredible public uh, groundswell of support because the argumentation that we did to fight Bill 30 back then was it was for the benefit of the students, not for our own necessary interests and our working conditions. And so people, uh, groups like People for Public Education were as effective in advocating for our political agenda, you know, Annie Kidder et al. and Kathleen Wynne back then, uh, as any of our uh, select PR departments and the, the five affiliates back then were. I think in the current election, we're not making that pitch that necessarily the, 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 the negative consequences of Bill 122 are seen, I think, by the public, and certainly in the public's opinion, the unions as opposed to the teachers, but the teacher unions, as self-serving. And I'm wondering that if maybe part of the strategy uh, has to be, and I agree that we don't do a lot of self grandstanding PR, because that really is totally ineffective. It's been shown by polling. The moment you have any connection with a union in an ad, uh, it loses immediate credibility for a large part of the, of the audience. You know, so I'm, I'm just thinking there maybe has to be a, a, a shift in the, in the strategic thinking of the union leadership. I think the, the rank and file teachers do it all the time. And the, the parents generally love their, their kids' teachers. But when you ask the question then, well, what about their unions and their leaders, then suddenly uh, the, uh, the acceptance levels drop dramatically. So I'm just wondering if the American teachers have maybe realized that sooner than we have, because we're also protected by statutory membership. We don't have to fight for our membership, folks. Tim was talking about the, you know, the, the relatively cushy attitude we have in, in the Anglosphere. But in Canada, we have statutory membership. You know, the moment when Harris threatened to take statutory membership out, internal polling in this organization found 40% of the members would leave because they would be saving on their dues. You know, so <coughs> I'm just wondering if you have some Okay, uh, Janice Steele. Uh, um, yeah, a couple of my points touch on what has been said already. One of the things, and I think Manfred, you touched on it as well, is you know the complacency of, of teachers. We 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 don't have UDAC. Hopefully we don't. Um, but to, to mobilize our members, like they have to feel really threatened, and I don't think they do. And I think you know, Peter, what you were talking about. I think just a small percentage of teachers are aware of what's going on in the states and what's coming. And even if they're aware of it on the periphery, it doesn't seem to really affect them. And I think we need to have like a, a nuts and bolts approach. I agree that we need to have the community uh, there, you know, it's crucial um, that they are in the fight with us. And so it's a step, you know, we've got uh, a couple of problems. One is, um, you know, the complacency amongst teachers. <coughs> Another one is we're a very multicultural city, um, and we need to be able to communicate with, you know, teachers of you know a lot of other languages that we don't necessarily speak, and information has to be translated, literature has to be translated for them, um, and you need you need to have a an army to go out into the community and engage them. 
And now we, we don't have that because teachers are insulated. They, you know, do their thing. I'm so busy, I go home. If you could mobilize the teachers within the school right, and after school, go out in the communities, hold forums, um, and let the, the parents know, let the, uh, the taxpayers know, even if they're not parents or grandparents, that this is what we're up against. Um, I think that's the only way. I don't think we can expect our, our union doesn't have the manpower to do that. It's not our union. We are the union. Our, le our union leaderships just don't have, you know, the, the manpower to do that. But if we had, you know, uh, EDFO, if we had OSSTF, you know, getting together and having a plan of action, I think, you know, we could get some teachers to buy in and then more and more and more. Uh, it's, it's easy to sit around and say, yeah, we need to engage the <coughs> community, but that's a massive task. And I don't know how we would do that, right, without some kind of cooperation and, and addressing, you know, the issues that I've already mentioned. So do you have any insights on, you know, how to get that ball rolling, especially uh, communicating with, with our fellow teachers and I, with education workers? I have Theo, and then maybe I'll say one or two more people if they want to chip in, and then I'll go to Peter for concluding remarks, and so now we're at 6.30. Oh, I thought okay. we were adjourned at 6.30. Okay, well, uh, you're right, are, there's a group, are you comfortable continuing on for another five or six minutes? People okay with that? Can I get a kind of a sense of the room? Yeah. People okay with that? Yes? I'm okay. Yeah. Okay? Okay. All right, so we'll continue on for another five or six minutes. Okay. Uh, so, I uh, feel, anyone else wants to speak before I go back to Peter to wrap it up? I think, I think I'm going to go a little bit out of the box. Uh, the, the thing is, with unions, it, it started even 40, 30 years ago, basically, with globalizations. I mean, what, what corporations did they basically outsourced a lot of their work out of the country and created basically less and less memberships. And I think one of the things that we're facing basically in the education system, maybe in the not too distant future, is basically the same thing is going to happen. Like with technology and everything else, the topics, you know, that Peter is saying, like bringing in schools, charter schools and stuff like that, 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 that is becoming an easier issue. You know? and, and those are those are the things that we're gonna be facing. And as far as you know who brings it's austerity. I mean governments are running deficits years after <coughs> years. So there's more money sucked out of the public purse to be shared with everybody. And I think all the all the programs are basically competing for the same tax dollar. And the only way the tax dollar comes from is basically from the people that have jobs. That's uh, that's my input on, on the whole thing. Like you know, it, it's 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 been a trend that it's not now. Like it's a it's an ongoing trend. I mean, most of the big uh, steel unions and everything else, they weren't dismembered because they basically outsourced the work outside of the country, you know, so we don't, we don't do as much of that manufacturing and everything else that we used to do. And I think that, that's a, that's a, that's a problem. Peter, do you want to close the Yeah, I, I mean, Alan Sears is, is great on this, actually really digging into some of the reports from the Ontario Ministry of, of Education and Training in the mid-90s, which was making this kind of argument that our education system hasn't kept pace with the globalization of the economy and the technological advancement and teachers need to be retooled and our school, you know, that everything needs to be changed and it was presented as this kind of technocratic problem which would require technocratic solutions and it, it's not quite that but, it, you know, the underside of that is the political attack and the mobilization of corporate power I think you highlighted. The other really important thing that you, that you said I think um, and we're seeing emerge in this kind of social justice approach is really kind of saying like the reason in the US that education policy is such a hot topic and I would say here as well is that because our governments federal and state and here provincial don't actually have real credible job policies job creation policies we have no real you know economic investment strategies you know for creating new manufacturing and new industry and creating better jobs and so on so everything gets put on education right and this, this guy Brill Steve not Steve Brill uh, another Brill 
wrote a, uh, a really important book, um, Class Dismissed, that really kind of takes us apart in the U.S. and how education, you know, it's just not it's not quite the answer that that these pundits are putting it out to be in terms of and all the education in the world. In other words, doesn't matter if the jobs aren't there, and that's just as true in Canada as it is in the U.S. Um, and just a couple, just to finish, like how do we organize the kind of latent army? I think we have, a, this is how I would reframe it, we have a latent army of members in teacher unions. And this is why we have so much potential power. And this is why we're under such heavy attack politically. Um, even if our members aren't quite aware of how extreme things are in the U.S. or, or what the kind of recent attacks here in Ontario or in British Columbia or in some of the other provinces mean. Um, it's a question of how do we how do we mobilize that lane power, right? And you know, we have a lot of leaderships that aren't ready to actually commit to doing that, and we need to maybe replace them in some places. But we also need to just push them, and we can only do that by organizing ourselves in spaces like this, for instance. I mean, unions, education unions in Ontario and throughout Canada actually have a lot of really interesting spaces, both inside schools and kind of across the union that members could really take back and turn into activist spaces to push a more uh, kind of community and workplace agenda of mobilizing the ranks and pushing beyond just what, just what education means for people with kids, but actually opening up schools for entire communities to do you know, education and community gatherings and meetings and really reimagine what school building could be like in Canada and the U.S., right? So that would, I mean, there's a couple other great points and I, that also speaks to something Tim said, like what's going on inside the unions and that it's rank and file folks thinking through what are the spaces that exist either in our school buildings or in our unions that we can try to take back, you know, one bit at a time. If we can't necessarily or, or even want to take over the union, <laughs> There are spaces within the union that we can start to rebuild as activist, member-driven, democratic spaces to push these kind of larger political, social justice-oriented projects. So maybe I'll just leave it there. Because, uh, I know people need to get on this. Okay. Thank you very much, Peter, for your presentation.